Travis Wayne Goodsell. I should be going to bed, but I guess we'll do three days in a row of doing a video and then uploading it, making it and uploading it the next morning. I, if I were to do a title, Jesus Christ Sues LDS Church, would that get people's attention? <laughs> we'll go over that. Uh, but I was looking over the uh, top videos of mine, the most popular. Uh, breaking news, Russell M. Uh, breaking LDS news, Russell M. Nelson changes Temple Covenants again. Uh, 4.3K. That was four months ago. Uh, what's interesting is that was again. Uh, I think that was see four months yeah that was during the lawsuit that's when I caught Nelson uh, and, and uh, mentioned that he was plotting to start up polygamy again to the federal judges and so Nelson comes out <laughs> with a statement all pissed <laughs> so that's good to see that one's the top one uh, list and order of all LDS Mormon church last days signs in heaven see because I really don't want to put second coming because Mormons don't believe in a second coming that's what we'll get to here in a second uh, LDS last days exodus has begun did I say it was 3.7 for the list in order uh, last days exodus has begun is 2.5k that was just two months ago uh, eight months ago, that was the earthquake, uh, the Magna earthquake, 2.2K, 1.1K, uh, LDS, last day's exodus, identifying the Mormon signs in heaven, uh, the, that one in the list and order, I helped get a boost, because I'm link them to my now over 37,000 uh, video on my old channel and uh, and so people were uh, going down to see the comments and saw the link I guess and then clicked on it and then uh, 1k LDS Apostle Bednar calls for death of Mormons Mormons were pissed at me I just, wow, seriously, you did not listen to him on his little video conference with the whatever group? I mean, seriously, you just think, oh, whatever he says is good and true and, and is from Jesus. <laughs> seriously? <laughs> Coronavirus is taking away our agency. Dear God. And so then everything else is below a thousand as a result. As a faithful and devoted Mormon, why am I now an ex Mormon? Oh, I'm showing my scriptures there before I was threatened with with eviction. So yeah, they're all packed up still. I mean it takes time. And yeah, they were purposely doing it to protect the church in the lawsuit of which I humiliated them. And yes, this time around, I it, gloves are off. You know, I I didn't expect the other one to do anything, but lo and behold, they gave it to me, but then the judge took it away. But, uh, yeah, and then the time capsule one, 781, YouTube violates law, so that's interesting, that's not even a Mormon one, 676, uh, and then correction to LDS Mormon churches, hundreds of billions, because I reported on it at first, and then saw his videos, uh, and and needed to make a correction and so yeah it was more serious than what I was initially hearing and then the 
breaking LDS news, LDS missionaries coming home, fulfilling biblical prophecy, or uh, Heber C. Kimball's prophecy, and then Nelson took it away. The <laughs> second coming's on hold. That video did not do well. It's not in the top 12. So, yeah, the 12 is LDS Mormon Church, fake gold plates in Panama. Yeah. LDS Mormons allowing second coming to pass over them. Uh, there's Russell M. Nelson hinge point repetition of history. That was from April conference. And it's like Mormons just are clueless. I, I, as a Mormon, I knew I had to study. Mormonism. It's not something I just take lightly. I just attend church and call myself a good person. I knew I had to study. They told me I had to study. Study your scriptures. And then as I get older, it became read your scriptures. <laughs> but, no, we're supposed to study them. And so part of studying is connecting all the scriptures together to see what patterns are there and and figure out the gospel and, and all that stuff and and so for Mormons to not connect the words of the presidents of the church let alone all of the other apostles who were going out throwing out commandments Mormons end up creating Mormon myths it's just so frustrating being Mormon alright so anyway Jesus Christ as a mortal man. Seriously, Scripture Edition? Why are you slow? I'm typically not slow. First Nephi, chapter 1. Nephi says in verse 2, I make a record in the language of my Father which consists of the learning of the Jews. And all Mormons miss it. They don't understand. Oh, we're supposed to liken the scriptures unto ourselves? Oh! <laughs> Hello? This is part of studying. And if Mormons aren't studying, and they're just going around saying, Oh, I love the Book of Mormon so much, it makes me so happy! Yeah, screw you for your emotional blackmail and then lies. It's just unbelievable. And so, which Jews are they talking about? Well, in the first year of the reign of King Zedekiah. When was that? <laughs> um, uh, Roman period? You know, Mormons don't bother to do any work whatsoever. They just coast through Mormonism. So frustrating. The learning of the Jews is the pre-captivity Jews. What is the pre-captivity Jews? Well, first, you it would be good to know what post-captivity Jews would be. We can go right into the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 2, and on the seventh day, oh, well there we go, seventh day, rested from all his work which he had created. So seven days, well we have a calendar system of seven days. Oh, okay, cool. So it's the same calendar system as it's always been. <laughs> Seriously? This is why you need to study. You don't just read. You don't just sit in Sunday school and go, Oh, yeah, okay, whatever, cool. And so, yeah, the seventh day is Sunday. <laughs> why are the calendars having Sunday at the first day of the week? Shouldn't it be the seventh day? You guys just don't think. 
And of course, I'm talking to Mormons, and the, my audience is ex-Mormon, and so you guys think. But uh, please understand that if I've offended any ex-Mormon. <laughs> you have to do your research. Who created a seven-day week calendar? Was it the Egyptians? Was it Adam? Or somebody else? If it was somebody else, then we're looking at a, what's called an anachronism where somebody writes in something that did not occur because it wasn't invented or known about at the time that they're claiming the book is being written. And so, for the seventh day, the calendar, Babylon. This is post-captivity Jewish information. There was no seven-day week calendar, and especially a day of rest on the seventh day, until the Babylonians came around, around 650 BCE. If you don't know that simple little feature, you're going to miss a whole bunch of meaning in Scripture. And so, yes, we now know that the Bible was not written by Moses. It was claimed to be written by Moses, by somebody after the Babylonian captivity. This is how you do research on the Bible. And yes, Christians all miss this too. <clears throat> But it's one of those simple things that everybody who goes into religious study, biblical study, should know and understand before they start creating truth. So, uh, let's talk about David and Solomon. King David you know, you've got the story of him as a little boy going up against Goliath and slaying him with a sling, and then he becomes king of all Israel. <laughs> because Saul was naughty and, and chose to sacrifice rather than to obey. <laughs> and so uh, we have King David. And uh, there's Paleo-Hebrew in regards to King David. It's the, let's make sure I can know that you're able to see rather than me doing this or doing this or this or that or whatever. So yes, that's the Star of David. The outer circle makes it the shield of David. The Magan. Not Maga. <laughs> Again. And uh, the reason why the star is uh, this, the star of David is because the two triangles that make it up are the D in Paleo Hebrew. If you know anything about Greek, you know, Delta Sigma Chi, Delta Force. And delta is the triangle. It's the same. Same script. Greek and Paleo-Hebrew. And uh, so, no, Paleo-Hebrew is not Semitic. So when you go and you find out that somebody's claiming that Proto-Sinatic is Paleo-Hebrew, but it's Sinatic, or, yeah, Semitic, <clears throat> well, they're wrong. It's not Paleo-Hebrew. It's maybe Paleo-Semitic Hebrew. I doubt it because it was in uh, Saudi Arabia. Yeah, Saudi. Uh, yeah, Saudi Arabia, the Sinai. Is that? Yeah. I'm trying to mix the ancient with the modern. <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, right across from Egypt, in the Sinai Peninsula. 
and uh, uh, and so if it's Semitic it would mean that it's Mesopotamian which they didn't come clear around until the Babylonians and so I, I don't think William Foxwell Albright is even correct for that justification uh, Aramaic would be closer to <laughs> the original uh, Semitic language alphabet than proto cyanatic but when you start with an incorrect theory and you go off off the deep end in all sorts of claims and because nobody fact checks you well, that's another story and so uh, David is the two D's and uh, it has the wa or bav depending on which language you're using whether it's Aramaic or Semitic Hebrew uh, if it were uh, uh, Greek as I suspect then it would be the Greek equivalent and we probably I probably should be using those phonemes uh, but uh, people need to know what I'm talking about but uh, it doesn't matter well I may because I promised uh, Amanda that I would work on an updated version of my big book of signs for the latter days and I went through all the trouble to uh, transfer the, the files over to my computer and then uh, just barely today spending all day transferring them to uh, uh, back onto another device and I have to start deleting them from this computer making sure that I save only my publications so anyway uh, uh, David the two D's is the word for love and uh, most Jewish scholars claim that it probably has something to do with the word for love in the sense that they look like two breasts uh, that uh, uh, is correct but it needs to be understood under a dualism because babies uh, love breasts different than older men love breasts if you understand the different loves that are involved there though older men can seek comfort as scripture does talk about comfort and pomegranates <laughs> but nonetheless uh, that understanding uh, is is how I deciphered Paleo Hebrew, uh, knowing that William Foxwell Albright is completely wrong and off his rocker, and now he's dead, so I can't tell him to his face. But uh, nobody else has stepped up to say, yeah, he was wrong. This is the way it is. And then you get guys like John Tavetness, who was with Farms at one point in time. I think he's retired now, but who cares? Uh, he did his thesis paper and apparently that's all he did with his life afterwards because that's all he's known for they still announced him decades later oh yeah he's the one who did the thesis on the the uh, connection to Semitic with he biblical he or Hebrew and really he hasn't done anything since He's wasted his whole life with the paper that was, you know, pretty much labor intensive rather than discovery. <laughs> okay, have fun with that. Uh, but uh, uh, so we have King David, and he has sex with Bathsheba. Uh, Sheba is considered. Uh, down in Cush, which is Ethiopia. And so uh, Beth is house. In Egyptian, house means queen. And so when uh, 
it's talked about that the daughter of Pharaoh finds Moses in the Nile River as she's bathing there. Uh, no. <laughs> Wrong translation. It's House of Pharaoh. Uh, but it didn't make any sense to the post-captivity Jew who's writing this. He does not understand that virgin girls are not allowed to raise babies by themselves. They have to be married. <laughs> and thus it's the queen who represents the house. And so it was the queen who finds the baby and raises it as her own. That has symbolic, prophesaic, prophesaic messianic uh, symbolism or prophecy. And uh, uh, I don't think anybody's caught on to that. Uh, there's a uh, story with Solomon who's established as king now and he's the second born of David are you doing your research David's first born dies and so uh, he then marries Bathsheba and has Solomon and uh, Solomon as king sitting on his throne of judgment has two mothers coming to him and they're both claiming ownership of a baby and it ties directly into the Moses baby narrative and uh, uh, the one mother says the baby's mine and the other one says no it's mine and then King Solomon says okay we'll chop the baby in half and we'll give each of you a half would you like the top or the lower half? <laughs> the one mother says, Great, I'll take the top half. <laughs> the other mother says, No, just give her the baby. Spare the baby. And Solomon, therefore, is wise and all-knowing and and says, ah, the woman who doesn't want the baby to die is the real mother. <laughs> and so modern day comic shows have now had it set up so that uh, uh, they try to outdo the other on being good. <laughs> no, I want you to have the baby. No, no, you beat me to it. No, I wanted you to have the baby. <laughs> but it used different things other than babies. But um, uh, Welcome to Mooseport. I think that has a political example of, uh, of complimenting the opponent. <laughs> the one guy is upset that he didn't compliment the other one first. <laughs> Oh man, he beat me to that strategy. And uh, so, funny stuff. But uh, uh, Solomon, being the birthright blessing son to King David, is then the heir to the throne. Solomon, as I've gone over with you, uh, is Salem. That means peace. But there's that N at the end. What is that N at the end? And I've gone over it with you. If it were the word Solomon, it's not Hebrew. Salem, yes. Uh, Semitic Hebrew, even yes, because they have three letters. Though uh, I have discovered that they also use determinatives, but it's different because of the different meanings of the characters they're not supposed to be using Paleo-Hebrew so Babel for example uh, Babel is a Babylonian thus Semitic uh, post Babylon and, uh, and so it 
is the Aramaic script that you're supposed to be using to identify the meaning of Babel uh, for the Semitic version of the spelling. And so it's House of Bell. The B at the beginning is the uh, shape of a house in Aramaic. But in Paleo-Hebrew, the J stroke indicates that it's a human, and then with the triangle, it's a person putting the hand up to their face. And so it's communication or eating, uh, something that you uh, do with your mouth. And so when you uh, read the text talking about the Tower of Babel and uh, people being confounded in their speech, and uh, so the biblical author did know that one as it was passed down and so that's how you can identify the difference in vocabulary if you know anything about Brown, Driver, and Briggs's Hebrew English lexicon uh, they, they don't know how to separate the meanings from the various same spelling of words and so there's a lot of corruption uh, by influence of other cultures' words into original Paleo-Hebrew. And so they, because they don't know how to separate them and distinguish them, uh, they just throw it all together with what they can understand from the Biblical Hebrew text, which is where they got it from, which was corrupted, uh, being well over... Uh, not well over, almost 2,000 years old of a Paleo-Hebrew script and language. And so uh, that's where I come in, having deciphered Paleo-Hebrew. But Solomon has that N at the end. And just like Babylon, uh, but it's in a different context, it's the kingdom of the house of Bel. Uh, whereas uh, uh, Babel, with uh, confounding of uh, the covenant, uh, you have uh, instead, uh, if you were to put an N at the end of it for the kingdom, then it would be the kingdom of Babel. And they're both kingdoms of Babel. They're not Babylon. You're not supposed to pronounce that determinative. Uh, and so Solomon, he's not a kingdom. He's a king of, of a kingdom, of Jeru Salem. See how that works? So it's king of Salem, or King Salem, of the kingdom of Salem, of New Salem, or well, people sort of wonder what Jer Jeru means, and most of them say, well, it means new, and they guess because uh, that site uh, where Jerusalem was uh, used to be called Salem, and so everybody assumes, oh, Jerusalem, New Salem. Uh, good guess, but no. Use Paleo-Hebrew, and all of a sudden it makes sense. The, uh, the initial letter uh, is Yah. You can find it only one place in all of the Old Testament. It's in Psalm uh, 115, I think. Or is that the one where the uh, idol gods or idols are, are explained very simply and easily, and yet everybody nowadays thinks that porn is not an idol. <laughs> and it's not idolatry to believe that porn destroys families. <laughs> but, uh, it's somewhere in there. <laughs> I let, uh, take the time. I'll do this tomorrow so I can take the extra time now, I guess. But uh, uh, 
and so Solomon is the king of peace sound familiar isn't that supposed to be Jesus's title but wait a minute isn't Jesus also supposed to be the son of David did you know that okay 68 yeah so 115 is the idol worshiping uh, sing unto God sing praises to his name extol him that rideth upon the heavens by his name Jah <laughs> which is the European corrupted phoneme of the Yod which is the Pali or the Semitic Hebrew version uh, and like I said it would be Z for Zeus if it were Greek which I should use as Greek because it's not Semitic uh, so let's show you that he is the king of the David chapter 1 of Matthew the book of the generation of Jesus Christos the son of David the son of Abraham there you go King David which is interesting that he's the son of Abraham because it's Isaac <laughs> but then they go into a genealogy and there's a whole bunch of other names and there's no way that that many names equal the amount of time to Jesus they fix the genealogy to make it work and it's exactly 40 and thus symbol and blah 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 so yeah Matthew is screwing around <laughs> but uh, that's who he was supposed to be Jesus Christ is supposed to be Solomon the king of peace as Christians say that Isaiah said so no he didn't <laughs> no he didn't but uh, that's what Christians believe and so thus Mormons believe thanks to the 1923 reincorporation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as they needed to find some other religious path than Brigham Young's polygamy and uh, uh, Joseph Smith's uh, whatever that was because they don't know <laughs> so they decided oh evangelicals sounds great yeah they love idolatry let's do idolatry just like the evangelicals so that's why we're more attractive to evangelicals though evangelicals are more repulsed by Mormons because uh, when we when they find out that hey you don't believe in our Jesus <laughs> you're not real Christian but yeah Jesus Christ is the king of peace he is Solomon so now it puts a whole new spin on the story in the book of Kings which Samuel is what it is uh, but uh, it's technically supposed to be first second third and fourth Kings rather than the Samuels but because Samuel uh, is talked about in the first two for the most part uh, they decided to name him Samuel <coughs> and so uh, then you get into archaeologists digging frantically in around the Temple Mount and in Jerusalem wherever they can find anything looking searching for anything that confirms that King David was there they'll even take King Solomon <laughs> but they can't find it they can find later kings that claim to be from King David uh, from the house of David but they can't find David himself and it's frustrating for them but uh, uh, they've at least proven the Roman period times uh, and and uh, the other kings like I mentioned uh, but uh, not to King David and King Solomon and to the breakoffs of the two sons of Solomon and there's a reason it's because they didn't exist 
as actual humans unless you understand the concept of fictional prophecy and uh, I've gone over that with you uh, fictional prophecy is just like apocalyptic literature you're prophesying of a future time latter days uh, but it's all fiction in the sense that you're using your time period to give uh, parable stories of what is to happen uh, in the future <coughs> and a lot of that they find their information from the stars and the movements of the celestial bodies as they were superior at knowing astronomy and uh, uh, and so uh, Matthew screws up the prophecies of Solomon Jesus Christ uh, right here in the beginning of the book in chapter at the end of chapter 1 uh, he's he quotes from Isaiah but doesn't call him Isaiah it just says the prophet and and the Isaiah says he's supposed to be named Emmanuel that's his name it's supposed to be Emmanuel and yet Matthew then says and so Joseph calls him Jesus <laughs> I think the angel even says, call him Jesus, and thus will fulfill the prophecy that his name will be Emmanuel. <laughs> it's like, what? No, what? no. But how many people know Emmanuel versus Jesus? Exactly. It's a beautiful female name. Emmanuel. Isn't there some movie series of Emmanuel? Uh, but uh, uh, once you understand prophetic fiction then you can read with a different mindset different paradigm technically speaking it's where uh, you find out that Santa Claus is no longer real and so you no longer interpret Christmas through the eyes of believing in Santa Claus you now interpret Christmas as a denier a disbeliever in Santa Claus that change of thought change of mental thinking change of belief as you now have learned truth and uh, realize that you were lied to <laughs> before <laughs> And I'm probably going to have a whole bunch of people who still believe in Santa Claus getting all upset and putting hate comments. <laughs> Santa Claus is real, man. Don't diss on Santa Claus. Well, hey, Trump ruined Santa Claus or Christmas for us this year, so thank him. pronounce her here in verse 3 uh, the church refuses to lift the horror title from her she's not a prostitute she was obedient to the law and so even the Jews don't even go over I think it's chapter 48 of Genesis let me confirm Take extra time. Jacob, tell no, 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 are you kidding me? Uh, 
Zero lines. No. Is it 38? Judah has three sons. Tomorrow is a harlot. Yeah, way to go, Bruce. Thanks a lot. But because it was Bruce, I would put that in here. Uh, we can't get rid of it. They stopped publishing his Mormon doctrine and his other books. Why not change the headings now? We can correct them. Stop putting Tower of Babel in Ether. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Uh, the Book of Joshua is the Book of Jesus. That's the Hebrew name for the Greek Jesus. And so that's why archaeologists can't confirm that any of that was real history. All of the places that he says he battled and went to war with did not happen in the order, nor did they happen in the time period that they're supposed to have occurred in. Jericho, for example. It had been destroyed multiple times, but all previous to the time it was supposedly supposed to have happened. Hmm. Dilemma. Uh, and so, uh, when you understand that it's not intended to be actual history, but a... Prof uh, what was the term I used? <laughs> a prophetic fiction. Uh, then everything starts to make more sense everything's clearer because if you remember from your book of Jesus he too parts the sea in Jordan River and the Ark of the Covenant goes through it into the promised land that is symbolic as well as prophetic and it all ties into multiple translation meanings uh, for example uh, we can go sexual uh, we can go to Genesis chapter 1 we can go to the flood story we can go to the Nile River all of it involves waters parting land rising and uh, birthright blessing sun is all part of that and uh, comes from the Egyptians as the Book of Mormon says language of the Egyptians learning of the Jews and, uh, and so Solomon is Jesus Christ but he's not Jesus of the Gospels uh, there is an author and Ahmed Osman, I think his name is. Again, his books are packed. <laughs> but uh, uh, I think he talks about how Jesus Christ didn't live in the Roman times. He lived back in the Old Testament times. As I think that's what he's trying to do. Rather than, uh, yeah. He's got some great ideas, but he can't put them together into a cohesive argument. Uh, so, no, I don't need to do this. I know exactly where it is. So, as uh, Moses is understood as the Jewish Messiah, and Jesus is supposed to be the, the uh, son of David, as Solomon, and uh, Moses himself was through the wrong mother, uh, just like Solomon was from the wrong mother, Bathsheba, house of Sheba. Uh, even Moses is said to have had an, an Egyptian wife in Numbers chapter 12, which if you're wondering about the first vision and why Joseph Smith waited until 1838 uh, and then claimed that that was his method of contact from the beginning, Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, is what he's referring to there. And so, 
the Jews understand, the modern Jews understand their Messiah will be a mortal man. And I don't think Mormons understand that, because again, they don't study Judaism, they don't study anything in Mormonism either. <clears throat> and so when you read that Book of Mormon is in the learning of the Jews pre-captivity, and that Jesus fails to be the Messiah for the Jews, and Matthew screws up his doctor or his gospel. Uh, it's because Jesus did not exist during the Roman period. He's doing prophetic fiction, apocryphal literature, just like Revelation. Then you can go to section 103, verse 16. And Joseph Smith is claiming to be receiving revelation, and the revelation is telling him, Therefore I will raise up unto my people. Mormons, a man who shall lead them like as Moses led the children of Israel. And Mormons should know, just by sitting in church listening, that uh, at the Kirtland Temple uh, during Passover, which I don't think is mentioned unless you have somebody who actually, a teacher who actually did their research and read the manual. <laughs> I think it's in the manual. Uh, but uh, uh, during Passover, uh, Joseph is visited by Elijah and Moses. Again, if you don't understand the current Jews and their understanding of the Passover and their concept of the Messiah, and you don't understand what Joseph Smith is doing. And uh, uh, he's claiming to be the Messiah, the Jesus Christ, the Solomon of the last days, the man like Moses. But, as you read here, uh, Joseph also knew it was not going to be him. In other places, he understands his organization is going to be taken over and he's going to be assassinated most likely sure enough that's exactly what happened great and abominable church as I did that video earlier and uh, uh, this is what Mormons need to be looking for for the latter days is a Mormon to rise up to be like um, like Moses so I'm not kidding when I said Jesus Christ sues the latter latter day saint, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. It may sound like I'm being hyperbolic and that I'm trying to get clickbait, <laughs> which you don't understand what clickbait is. It's for the purpose of getting money, uh, but. Uh, a lot of people don't do it for money, they just do it for popularity, to get views, shock value, but uh, the analytical programs have cut back on a lot of the, the shock value tactics, as I can no longer get away with what I used to be able to get away with on my older channel. Um, so let me put this for tomorrow. Jesus. Sues LDS. All right, and so uh, I again could go over it more and more for you that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints is in apostasy and needs to be restored. Section eighty-five, verse seven, and there's no reason for one mighty and strong to restore or set in order the house of God. Because Joseph Smith set it in order. Why does it need to be set in order? What's going on? And why is the president of the church in verse 8 
being struck by lightning. <laughs> oh, right. Joseph Fielding Smith says he has no idea what that means and is most likely null and void because W.W. Uh, w. Phelps uh, repented. <laughs> and so it's, it's no longer a prophecy. Uh, so sad what Heber did. Bastard. Alrighty, and yet I, I'm, I come through Heber C. Kimball anyway, through the hoops line. <sighs> so, alrighty. Um, yeah, because I was doing my genealogy, found out that I tied into Kimball's line, and apparently that triggered alarms <laughs> at the church. As I went back to check on it sometime later and could no longer find the connection anymore. I had been blocked from it. <laughs> but that's my family. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah. And so, when you go over all of the prophecies, if you want to see it through the eyes of Joseph Smith, then it, it creates a whole new paradigm for you. Uh, because when you're looking for a Mormon born and raised into the apostate church, the great and abominable church that Joseph is warning us about, that will fall and then you go through all the scriptures and you realize wow there's a lot that has to be fulfilled can one person fulfill it all and then I've thrown in for you before other external scriptures that are not included in our scriptures also apply <laughs> such as the book of Jasher and the story of baby Moses. You think baby Yoda was awesome? And he is. <laughs> no, the blue wire into the red socket. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> but uh, yeah, baby Moses uh, is sitting on the lap of Pharaoh pulls off his crown, puts it on his head. <laughs> and Pharaoh freaks out, wants to murder the kid. <laughs> and the priests say, no, 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 no. Uh, he's just a baby. Let's do a test. <laughs> Let's put a, a jewel or some precious thing, and then we'll also put uh, a burning lump of coal. <laughs> if he goes to the jewel, yeah, kill him. If he goes to the lump of coal, <laughs> it's just a baby. <laughs> Let him live. <laughs> she's a witch. No, not. I know. If she floats, she's a witch. If she sinks, she's not a witch. <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy... Or not, uh, it's not the Holy Grail, is it? Which scene is that? Or which show is that from? Is that just one of the skits from Monty Python? Uh, but, uh, yeah. Um, hilarious. But, yeah, they... Lit you, you think it was fake? No, that those actually were the thought processes of people during the Spanish Inquisition and the witch trials. <sighs> but, uh... Uh, yeah, that's Moses chooses the call, burns his tongue, and so as a result, they're able to explain why he then tells the Lord the I am that I am, which everybody gets wrong. No, Paleo Hebrew. <laughs> Don't guess at the meaning of the name. Paleo Hebrew. It's very simple and easy. Uh, but. Uh, 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 
says, I am of slow speech. So, do you not have a brother? Can you not get him to speak for you? And so, oh yeah, right, got it. <laughs> but then Moses does all the speaking. <laughs> Charlton Heston does very well at speaking for himself. <laughs> or, um... The Gods and Ex... Or Gods and Kings, Exodus Gods and Kings. Uh, I can't remember his name. He was a Batman, and he was also a Termin or a, uh, John Connor for Terminator. Uh, oh well, whatever. But uh, uh, yeah, all of those. Also, I've found do apply as well. Uh, so why they were kicked out I don't understand plain and precious things were taken out weren't they and uh, that's part of it and so yeah you just go through and and uh, you can find out for yourself is Nelson who's sitting in the office of Moses is he the actual Moses of the latter days and you'll find out very quickly, oh, no, he's not. Born in the wrong year. Yes, we do know the year of when he will be born as a mortal baby boy, a man, and become a man. And, and so, yeah. we're at an hour, we're past nine, time for bed. Another movie popped into my head. I can't remember it offhand. Uh, it's uh, where a couple, Tim, the tool man Taylor, can't remember his name. I think it's also Tim, but uh, he also, uh, he's on the farm there, and the guy wakes him up early. 4 a.m., time for milking. So, funny, funny, funny. All right, good night.